morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Steve Call. I'm the, the dean here at the Graduate School of Journalism, also on the faculty, and I'll join a couple of colleagues to talk about our curriculum in a minute, but I just thought I'd make some introductory remarks and give you a sense of what uh, we're working on here at the school these days. This, uh, this school has been around for more than 100 years. It was founded by Joseph Pulitzer, and I think the faculty, like myself, were We've all had lives in journalism, pretty much all of us. Uh, a couple of historians and sociologists among us journalists, but uh, I think we're bound together by a sense of real belief, conviction, confidence that despite all the changes that surround journalism these days, and some of them are very important about the way journalism is practiced, that uh, the core values of professional journalism, reporting, storytelling, writing, public service, a sense of the public interest that informs our work, uh, an effort to be knowledgeable about what we report and write about, that these uh, have been the principles that kind of shaped this school over a long period of time and they still animate our faculty as we think about how to help you become successful journalists, which is the real kind of crux of the three master's degree programs that we now offer the one that's been around for a long time, the, the core MS program, which is suitable for uh, someone who's had a little bit of experience in journalism or is career switching into journalism from the right um, kind of background and wants to emerge as, a, as an entry-level professional journalist with all the skills and abilities uh, that the profession requires these days. Then there's the Master of Arts that you'll hear about from Elisa, one of our faculty members there, which is really for for folks who've had a little bit more journalism experience, really know how to report and write, but are looking to become expert in one of the tracks that that program offers. And then this year we have the first class of our new uh, master's degree in data journalism, which is three semesters, and which is a, a STEM-coded uh, effort uh, that has evolved here over the last few years to marry the new computational techniques that journalism increasingly requires with the core um, MS program that also delivers the reporting and writing and investigative skills that we try to provide to every uh, student that comes through here. So I would just say, I mentioned four or five things out of the dozen or two dozen that I might, uh, that I would say have been places of concentration for us over the last few years. Um, one is international journalism. This is a remarkably diverse uh, and excitingly diverse school, and one of its sources of diversity is usually about a third of our class comes from outside the United States. But we've also discovered over the last few years, particularly, that our uh, US-based students are really interested in global journalism, and our faculty is too. And so we've been doing more and more programming and more and more engagement around um, international reporting. Um, another area of emphasis has been investigative reporting. Um, we have added to our curriculum uh, uh, investigative reporting techniques instruction that ensures that every student, even if you're determined to be a sports reporter or you want to, um, to write deep immersion feature stories, um, we, we've discovered that I think our, and our students have given us a lot of p very positive feedback about this, that we can help you in any kind of journalism by learning how to use public records, how to use court records, how to file FOIA requests to make sure that you know where all the data is that journalists can access even if you're on deadline to make a, a, a distinctive story and also to prevent missing things that you want to know about when you're writing about someone. Um, and, uh, and we can talk more about investigative reporting at the school because there's also a concentration here in the MS that some of you might be interested in. I mentioned the data degree. In general, we've been investing in faculty who can teach in an interdisciplinary way between computation and journalism. We think that in order to carry out our public function as reporters these days to, to hold power, powerful institutions or individuals transparent, accountable before the public, in these days you, that means being able to reverse engineer algorithms that exercise power, allocate public resources, and, 
so not all of us need to do the math. Many of us got into journalism to avoid doing the math, but um, there's a real opportunity to to um, make a difference as a, as a journalist by being able to unpack some of these new sources of power that so dominate our public square. We've all been reading about this over the last year or two. Um, and I would just mention, lastly, um, in our instruction around video and uh, multimedia and audio storytelling, we have really been making um, important new kind of investments over the last couple of years, both in very talented faculty like Daniel Alarcon, uh, who is um, uh, a really remarkable audio uh, journalist who runs something called Radio Ambulante, which is the sort of This American Life in Spanish, but he's also just a master of podcasting and live performance and audio uh, in a very creative way. Uh, Nina Alvarez just joined our faculty. She's a documentary filmmaker and a video journalist uh, with a background both in network international correspondence and documentary filmmaking. And upstairs on the fifth floor, I guess it's probably not part of the tour today, but we just opened this year, uh, put a million dollars into a new multimedia studio, video studio. We've really been trying to shift away from, in our instruction around video and audio, shift away from the old anchor desk model of uh, television journalism, which is going away, <laughs> and, and to empower you to do the kind of journalism and video and audio that's actually happening in newsrooms today, which is very mobile focused. and and focused on all kinds of different integrations of, of media and storytelling with a lot of core reporting still at the heart of things. So I think that's a, a kind of sense of some of the big themes here and you can ask questions later. Why don't we all get up and, and uh, introduce a couple more colleagues on the faculty. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. My name is Elena Cabral, and I am the director of the part-time program here, the part-time MS program. How many of you are here to learn about that program? Great. Um, we generally draw from students in the New York area. We've had them come as far away from as far away as Philadelphia, D.C. I once had a part-timer who was a flight attendant who would fly in once a week from. Uh, Atlanta <laughs> on Delta um, and it sort of is a reflection of the cohort of students in this program who really want this experience who are at the point in their lives and in their careers where they really have a sense of direction a passion for writing and storytelling a curiosity and engagement with the world um, that defines m most of our students in this particular case these students work um, uh, for the most part full-time jobs and they take classes over here uh, at the school um, in a degree that is very much the same as the one you've, uh, you're you probably uh, very familiar with or becoming familiar with, the MS full-time program, which lasts 10 months. That goes from August to May. The part-time program extends over two years. So instead of uh, essentially two semesters, you uh, are here for six semesters. You apply now. You're in, uh, the, uh, we read the applications in January and February. We send out notifications in March. We graduate students in the, uh, uh, on a Wednesday in May, and then two days later, we've got a, an orientation for the part-timers who study here during the summer. And it's glorious because we have this whole building to ourselves and lots of resources and um, small classes with really wonderful professors who begin teaching you how to shoot and edit video on an iPhone not like a tourist, but like a journalist, how to collect audio, how uh, to use social media as a reporting tool and as a way to engage with your audience. And the reason for that is because we want you to think of yourself as a multimedia journalist right out of the gate. You spend that summer reporting, and then uh, in the middle of the summer, you start thinking about which classes you take in the fall when all the full-timers arrive, not just from the New York area, but from all over the country, and as Dean Cole pointed out, all over the world. Um, and then these students really start to mingle, to create these um, cohorts of interest, 
around radio, um, some of which is discovered in those first couple of weeks of training. I can't tell you how many students have just fallen in love with audio uh, just in the very first couple of weeks of training and then really pursue that by constructing their own curriculum. You know, there are requirements, but there are an enormous amount of choices within those requirements to go in the direction of data, of audio storytelling, documentary, um, video, um, or it towards subject areas such as sports reporting, religion writing, uh, covering education, uh, and so forth. And so there's a great deal of flexibility whether you do the program in 10 months or uh, in six semesters, that's two years. Uh, I myself as a gra uh, am a graduate of the two-year program. Um, and went into this sort of not quite sure what direction I was going uh, into, juggled a full-time job. It was quite difficult, quite exhilarating, quite exciting, some of the happiest years of my life. And then really entered into this community of journalists that remains for the rest of your professional life. Because as you've probably gathered, this is a very fluid industry in which journalists sort of uh, have very different lives um, over the course of 20, 30 years. Um, and that's what makes it really exciting. And so I tend to stay in touch with uh, our students um, as a uh, director of this program, as someone who has been a career advisor, uh, as someone who advises some of our affinity groups. We have several. Uh, in my case, I'm the faculty advisor for the National Association of Hispanic Journalists chapter. And I watch them go into um, you know, newsrooms, traditional newsrooms, and then into digital startups, uh, into video doc, and um, in the various directions our industry is moving. And it's so exciting to see, and certainly a wonderful time uh, to, to get into this field. Um, you don't have to be the kind of journalist who is in the halls, great halls of power. It's just Congress and um, Buenos Aires, if uh, uh, you're following the president currently. New York City in and of itself is an incredible laboratory to learn about all of the issues that concern you know so many of us today. And many of our students, part-time, full-time alike, break a lot of stories just by being in these neighborhoods and talking to people and learning to interview and to ask uh, difficult questions and to make mistakes. And that's what this program is really about. I will say one thing about the part-time program, which is that while it is catered to give uh, students who are working some flexibility, what I really like to emphasize is that it's not a night school because there's so much that goes on in this building all day long and all night long that um, you don't want to miss out on. And so if you have s some doubts about whether or not the part-time program versus the full-time program is right for you, please get in touch with me and I'd be happy to connect you with students who come to us from all walks of life, all types of, of jobs, some with kids, uh, some with disabilities, some with, you know, um, special circumstances. But as I said before, a real sincere drive to make this happen. And um, we do all, I, all we can to do that. Because as journalists, we know how messy life can be. I sometimes say graduate school is sort of like having a baby. There is never a good time to do it. There's always some damn thing in the way. But the truth is, if this is your calling, if this is your passion, um, it can work out. And this is an institution that has always been incredibly generous, um, incredibly open uh, to uh, people from all walks of life. And we welcome you here. Thank you. OK, thanks. Um, good morning, everybody. And I'm, I guess I should say um, good morning or good afternoon or good evening to people who are listening on the internet from all over the place. Um, I'm Elisa Solomon. I'm on the faculty here teaching in the MA program and the Arts and Culture concentration as well as teaching in the MS program. And I'm go going to concentrate on talking about the MA program and its curriculum and how it dis it's distinct from the MS program. But I wonder if people already know what the MS curriculum is like because I'm going to talk about how this is different. Um, is that something we should fill in first? Um, we could. Um, yeah, why don't, why don't you do that okay. <laughs> so that I can um, then talk about how MA is different from that. 
Yeah, so the expectation in the MS program, I mean, we're, we review applications, the faculty review applications, looking for why you want to be a journalist uh, is one of the big things we, we want to understand. Just make sure that your expectations of what we deliver are well aligned. But we don't really require in the MS, we, we, we look for a demonstrated interest in journalism, but we don't expect that you have been out on the street reporting in some way before this. Some of you have, some of you haven't. But the curriculum for the MS really starts with the fundamentals. So we want to make sure we're all speaking about the same vocabulary. We, we all have the same terminology when we talk about off the record or background. We, and we start with the basics. How do you go into a neighborhood and develop sources and find stories and talk to people you don't know? What are your points of entry? What are the fundamentals of reporting? How do you do how do you interview? What are the different kinds of interviewing? And while you're learning how to become a reporter, you're going to get a lot of mentoring and a lot of exercises and, and a lot of um, uh, time in New York. It's an incredible laboratory to learn how to report. People are, um, they're New Yorkers, you know, so they're, uh, they're sometimes confrontational, but they're also very open. And there's so much diversity in so many institutions to find stories uh, to write about. We want to make sure you know how to do the basics of news reporting. Uh, even if you don't want to be a breaking news reporter, to know how to uh, parse a press conference and find what the most important elements are, uh, how, to, how to choose the quotations that you use, all the basics. So we start with reporting, and we believe that no matter who you are, where you want to be in journalism, if you're a great reporter, then you'll be valued in our profession. You know, there's a, there is nothing that a newsroom wants more than someone who knows how to report independently, completely, accurately, deeply. The, the, your ability to tell great stories and writing and journalism is all built on that foundation. So that's where we start. We also provide you with an introduction to ethics, to media law that you need to know about. What are the, what are the ethical traditions that animate our profession? What are the expectations in the newsroom about your ethical conduct as a professional? What are the laws you need to know about so you don't trespass or invade people's privacy or otherwise uh, get yourself uh, crosswise? And we, and, we, and we start there. Then we have two other required um, uh, courses. One is writing uh, in the context of journalism. There's a lot, there's a big menu of writing courses that you can choose from. So if you're interested in writing for the ear or if you're interested in deep literary narrative writing, there'll be sections that you can select for yourself. Uh, we also require that you take seven weeks of investigative reporting techniques as a follow-on to the, to, the to the basic reporting that we'll do in the first nine weeks. Um, and this is what I mentioned before, making sure that everybody knows how to use public records and FOIA and, and court records and data sets and scholarly resources and other, other resources of deep reporting. And then in the spring, uh, you, you essentially take production workshops. Again, you have a wide menu of things to choose choose from. You can uh, take a sports reporting course. You can take investigative courses. You can take data courses. You can take international reporting courses, although we don't generally go very far from New York City, but we still we prepare you to do that um, and, and so on. So that's the basic. And then you graduate in the spring. I'm, I'm not sure. I've, you can take, I think there's a one other requirement that you take either a video, an audio, or a data course um, in, in the seven-week course along the way. Um, but that's the basic thing. By the time you graduate, you go to the big career fair in March, which is the largest career fair in journalism. We have hundreds of recruiters there recruiting our graduating class. You do a master's project. That's also one big piece of journalism that you do with an advisor. And you graduate in May as a fully fledged mm -hmm. entry level journalist, even if when you arrived in August, you didn't know what off the record really meant. So mm -hmm. that's the basic idea. Yeah. Some Great. people don't graduate, some people uh, graduate from our degree in May and then continue on with a number of, of uh, uh, dual degree programs that we've cultivated over the years. Uh, one with the School of International Affairs, uh, one in the religion department, um, Another was Sciences Po in uh, France, and uh, am I forgetting any? Ah, uh, two other dual degree programs in business and uh, law, and you can you know usually discover through some of the courses that Dean Cole just mentioned, you know um, the relevant connections between what we do as practitioners of journalism and these uh, fields. 
Okay, great, thanks. So now I can say how the MA is not <laughs> what, uh, what, you just, what you just heard about. Um, but I, I wouldn't actually say it as, as a matter of negation, but as um, a program that builds on the kinds of skills that one would learn in the MS program. And in fact, um, students in the MA program are expected to already have studied um, or learned in the field as professional journalists all the things that are taught in the MS. So if you apply, if you're, how many of you are thinking about the MA, by the way? Okay, great. So um, if, you're, if you're applying to the MA program, you should already have the equivalent of the MS degree, either because you actually did an MS program or because you've been working for some years uh, um, as a professional. You know how to report a story. You know how to put it together. You don't, um, you don't need to be taught those things. Instead, you're coming to the M MA program to spend nine, 10 months doing a deep dive into subject area so that you can write with more depth, nuance, knowledge, uh, capacity about a particular area that you really want to devote yourself to. Um, and those areas that we offer concentrations in and to which you, you would apply to a particular concentration, those concentrations are business economics, science, politics, and arts and culture. I teach in the arts and culture concentration, so I can talk uh, specifically about that program, but I want to give you the, a sense of what the scope of the MA program is um, first. So the curriculum has several key elements. Um, one is your anchor in the journalism school for the whole year, which is a year-long course with a very uh, creative name, seminar and major. <laughs> Um, so each concentration has its own, and it meets twice a week for three hours at a time. It's very intense and um, engage. It, it requires the engagement of students. It's a seminar. We sit around the table and we talk about things. We talk about things that you've read, which may be scholarly material, which will be journalistic material, which may be um, sort of primary documents and, and materials, all the kinds of things that uh, build one's knowledge to become a better journalist in an area. And often we are reading those materials with the guidance of an expert from somewhere else at Columbia. So, for example, in arts and culture, if we want to do a unit on the Frankfurt School of Critics, um, you know, I could lead that discussion. So could my colleague David Haydu, who also teaches um, arts and culture. But like right across campus, we have one of the world's greatest experts in Frankfurt School of Critics, um, Andreas Sweeson. So we invite him to come and to actually create a, a session specifically for journalists and why would you need, like why would you ever need to read Adorno who's really hard to read? Like how would that, how would that help you be a better cultural reporter? Um, so we're working, I'd say about a third of our sessions are with an expert from somewhere at Columbia in a particular area. So if it's, um, you know, if you're in, your, in the science concentration, it may be a neuroscientist or um, an environmental scientist or the, you know, the people who can really help science concentrators uh, beef up their knowledge in that area. Um, so you have your seminar and major. And then you have, and this is really unique to any of the advanced journalism programs that I know about, uh, you have the opportunity to take three electives in the course of the year, one in the fall and two in the spring, graduate level electives in other departments at Columbia. And this is extraordinary. I mean, because here we are at one of the greatest research institutions um, in, in the United States, if not in the world, um, and you can go take a course in um, the history department or the art history department or the film studies department or anthropology or the school of public affairs or even sometimes the law school or in um, uh, in ethnomusicology or in latin american literature like what whatever your area of concentration is and what you really want to um, burrow down into and really learn about you get the chance to do that in three electives over the course of the year um, the the other key components of the ma um, program 
our uh, a one semester course here in the J School called Evidence and Inference, which is a really cool class that I, in my 14 years here, I still haven't had a chance to sit in on, <laughs> um, but I'm always eavesdropping on, on students about th that class. It's, it's a, a course about how different fields um, define and create knowledge. So what, it, what does it mean to have verifiable information in, um, in the social sciences, in oral history, in other kinds of fields? And how can, how can journalists make use of that? There's also, I think, some elements of data and statistics in there, um, just in, in improving a journalist's literacy in uh, looking at material like that. And um, finally, in the curriculum, and, and, and then there are also some skills workshops and um, journalism essentials, where um, it's not the full course that the MS has in law and ethics, but it's a, a, a kind of overview of that stuff in case you're not up to date, and some opportunities for audio and, um, and photo workshops and investigative skills and so on. Um, and then there's a thesis project. So it's called thesis because we are, after all, the university, and to get credits for it, it needs to be called that, but it's not an academic document. It's a long-form narrative story, 8,000 words, that students work on with an advisor very closely, beginning in October all the way until it's due in April, from you know pitching to developing a reporting plan to um, doing the reporting, drafting it, uh, and redrafting it, and redrafting it, and redrafting it, and then you know line editing it until it's like a really great, beautiful 8,000 word magazine story, basically. Um, and a number of these uh, get published in in pretty fancy places, um, all kinds of good places at the end. So that's that's the basic shape of the MA. Um, in of course, I know the arts and culture students best. I can give you some examples of the kinds of thesis projects um, that they've done. Um, some amazing stories. We had one about um, an art program, art death row inmates um, in Tennessee who were had become artists, um, and their work was being shown and um, how that whole program worked and what it meant. Um, we had, uh, I think. I noticed, yeah, there, <laughs> Sarah Alcamel um, did her, her thesis about the um, sort of redevelopment, redevelopment of the old city of Cairo um, after the Arab Spring. Um, we had a story last year, a great story about the rebirth of Medellin um, after the drug years as the world capital of reggaeton. Um, we had a great story about the live action role playing in Palestine. Um, another about the about YouTube cooking shows as a kind of lifeline for wives of H one B uh, visa migrants to the U S. and and mostly wives who couldn't get work authorization and um, th in this case uh, women from India who were making these cooking shows or using these cooking shows um, as. Um, a tie to home and, and community and something to do with themselves. Um, and um, like there's, there's millions of them now I could talk about, but those just give you a taste of the kind of stories that, that people do. Um, so happy to answer questions about the MA program um, if anyone has them. Oh, yes. Well, there's two concentrations in the MS that you can apply to, you may have noticed on the website. One is uh, the Stabile program on investigative reporting, mm -hmm. and it is um, a way of, of experiencing the MS curriculum that I described before. The difference is that you enter a cohort of uh, Stabile students who are concentrating in investigative reporting right from the start, and your Although you are you do reporting with everyone else in the MS uh, class from the beginning You're getting together uh, and starting to concentrate on investigative reporting techniques right from the start um, of your experience in the program and the Stabile students um, Identify a master's project that has investigative challenges and and will be carried out through investigative reporting so the variety of of approaches that, say, other MS students might take to their master's project, the Stabile students are really going after something that, that really requires investigation and that is geared toward revelation and publication at the end of the, uh, of the work. And in the spring, the Stabile students, besides their sort of 
staying together from time to time to keep deepening their their skills and techniques and studying um, other kinds of work that's that's come forward and that's been successful. Um, in the spring, they're required to take one or two investigative reporting workshops. We offer a number of them. I teach one on investigating uh, defense and intelligence uh, agencies and subjects. Um, there are investigative reporting seminars on health subjects. There are investigative reporting subjects on using data across borders. We have a colleague, Giannina Sanghini, who's been involved with the Panama Papers and the Paradise Papers work. Uh, Columbia students have been involved in, in those collaborations, and she's always got something like that cooking in the spring. Uh, we have an investigative reporting workshop that a New Yorker colleague named Sarah Stillman teaches on gender and migration. That's quite a remarkable course, and uh, and so on. So that's the Stabile concentration. There's also the documentary filmmaking concentration, which is also part of the MS program. It is three semesters because after you finish your coursework in May, you make a film and you graduate the following December. Uh, I think next Saturday we have our annual documentary festival on Friday. The doc students graduate, and on Saturday we all sit in this room and watch their amazing films. Uh, this is great work that comes out of that program. Uh, but it, like the Stabile, is something is part of the MS uh, curriculum. You you get all of what I described before, but you are a cohort that is geared toward making this film, particularly in the spring when you start to choose your, your filmmaking partner and your subject. And um, uh, you have to apply for admission into the documentary concentration as, as with the Stabile Investigative yeah. Reporting concentration. Thank you. Thank you all. I think we have time for three or four questions. Um, I would like to invite you to use the microphone here um, in the center aisle so that those who are listening from the live stream, and there are quite a few, um, can hear your question, um, and then, of course, the answers. Mm -hmm. Please come up, to, come up to the microphone, sure. And if you've got a question, you can just come right up to, to form a line to ask the questions. Go ahead, please. Hi, my name is Shabantal, and um, getting to journalism, journalism is kind of new for me. Mm -hmm. I just want to ask um, Mr. Steve Cole that if you're doing data journalism, can you also take classes for investigative pro from the investigative program? Yes, um, you can. If you if you take if you enter into the uh, data journalism program, you'll your first semester will take place in the summer, and that. Um, is designed to both introduce you to reporting in a general way, as we talked about before, but also we front load a lot of the computational work in the summer. So you'll be in courses that will um, introduce you to coding and algorithms and data science in the context of journalism. And then when everyone else turns, turns up in uh, late August for the MS program, you will move into the MS curriculum with your data cohort. You'll stay together for some things, but you'll mix into courses for other things. And in that context, you'll take investigative techniques with an emphasis on data, but with other techniques included. And in the spring, you'll have electives uh, that can include investigative reporting. So you could choose to, uh, and in my classes uh, over the last few years, there, have, there has always been one or two or three data specialists in our group of 15 or 16. And when we do our collaborative investigative reporting project, uh, in, in my course, as in many, you do an individual uh, story, but you also collaborate with the rest of the class on a big investigative project. And having those data concentrators in that mix has always been a, a real advantage because they can do things that uh, the rest of us can't do and that adv advances our work. All right, thank you. Good morning. Um, my name is Angie. I recently graduated from Brooklyn College with a bachelor degree in um, broadcasting journalism. And I just want to know which program it's better when you just graduated from this program already, uh, the MA or the MS. 
especially because I want to become an investigative journalist. Mm -hmm. So I know that for investigative journalism specifically, the actual program, there are specific requirements that I don't fulfill yet. Mm -hmm. You know, I would say that if you haven't yet worked in a newsroom, you know, you're, you're a recent graduate, but you have some experience and certainly have been focusing on journalism, really uh, determined to pursue it, the MS program is probably the best place for you. Um, my experience is that um, as much as you think it, you've learned about journalism in an undergraduate, there's still so much more. And what you get here are, you know, more than instructors, but the like, writing coaches, people who are going to really push you to develop a voice, to develop a specialization, let's say, in a particular subject area, um, and introduce you to, uh, as, per, as uh, Dean Cole pointed out, the idea that broadcast uh, journalism is really changing and that there are a lot of other options for you to think about and cultivate uh, and perfect as, y as you are here. Unlike an undergraduate concentration, this is a professional school. So for example, uh, whether you're in the documentary concentration or in um, Sam Friedman's book writing class, you are developing a professional piece of work that you're expected to put out into the world and to publish and there is a good deal of training in, uh, that is involved in that process um, you know and so uh, being a part of the initial classes the foundational classes in reporting you know I remember th when I applied to the part-time program I'd already been working for about uh, three years and thought I knew you know uh, everything there was to know about really authoritative, sharp, clear writing. You, I had no idea how much I really had to learn. You know, this is the kind of place where you have to be open to having your writing torn apart and built back up again. And to be able to say to an editor when you do get to that expo that you are prepared to write about anything and to cover just about anything. Um, and you will. Thank you. Hi, thank you. <clears throat> My name is Monica Hunter-Hart, and this is a question about the Stabil program. Um, so when you're talking about that program, it seems like there are so many additional things that you get, but in comparison to normal MS students, is there anything that you would be missing out on or would not have time for? Um, well, you're, you're making a commitment to a certain kind of reporting that is very demanding and, and um, you know, isn't as it's hard it would be hard to do um, if you if your if your goal was to do um, a profile writing or literary journalism or immersion journalism that was you know away from getting to the bottom of some uh, institutional problem or uh, social problem um, you know there's a, there's an enormous range of great journalism uh, in in the canon and and in in the world right now and not all of it involves uh, tearing down barriers to get underneath the surface of a story which is really what the Stabile program is trying to teach you to do it, it's it's about complex source development it's about uh, building insights through the collection of original data it's about linking public records to interviewing and 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 then through that revealing important information that is not in the public sphere and if that's what you do for 10 months there's not a lot of bandwidth to learn uh, how to be the most possible the most graceful possible literary writer that you could otherwise be <laughs> so that it's 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 not yeah so that I think that's the consequence of it you you want to be sure that um, records driven interview driven data driven revelatory investigative reporting is what you want to do and if if you come into the regular MS program because you imagine that you're because you're not entirely sure which kind of journalism you're going to concentrate on or where investigative reporting is going to fit the reverse is you still have an opportunity to do investigative reporting as an MS student. You're going to take a required course that's going to teach you a lot of the core techniques. And if you're passionate about those, you can apply them to your master's project and, and develop your skills. And as an MS student, you can take invest you can take nothing but investigative reporting workshops in the spring. <laughs> if if by the time you get to the balloting right about now, mm -hmm. you decide that's what you want to do. So you can fashion a quasi-stabile experience without being being instabile. 
yeah. and but then you have the freedom to not necessarily double down in that direction if when you get here you discover that there are other passions that you have that you want to use your time to pursue that makes sense thank you good morning thank you my name is sarah sheridan i just had a question about the dual degree programs um i was just wondering if any of you could expound a bit upon them particularly the international affairs um dual program i'll take that one okay <laughs> Um, the dual degree programs at Columbia, in general, you apply separately to each school, um, with the exception of the program with computer science. Um, and you'll spend a year at journalism and a year or two years, depending on the length of the, the second program, at the other school. Um, and so you will be fulfilling all of the journalism requirements and the primary requirements at the other school. Um, and basically it helps you to cut off at least a semester and sometimes two semesters. Um, so in the, the case of the program with International and Public Affairs, you do a year at journalism, a year at SIPA. You can do it in whichever order you like. You can start at SIPA, finish at journalism, or the reverse. Generally people who do the law program um, start with the law school mm -hmm. so they can get all of the basic law courses, the torts course, they can get those out of the way. They come to journalism and then they finish at the law school. Business, people would probably start at business and then come to journalism as well. Um, religion, people can go either way. And then just a quick follow-up question. So would it be possible to enroll at the journalism school unsure if you want to do a dual degree and then enroll in another program as well simultaneously? Generally, you must know at the point that you're applying that that's what you want to do. Awesome. Thank you. Sure. Hello. Um, <clears throat> my name is Dennis McKeon. Um, I apologize if I uh, this was already addressed, but uh, Elena, you were terrific. Uh, Alyssa mm -hmm. and Steve as well. Um, my question is this. It's um, almost an ex existential question. The future of journalism. Uh, I have, have gone to making a mid-career change, mm -hmm. and I had heard uh, from a professional career counselor that journalism is dead. Uh, okay. <laughs> All right. um, I'm, I'm sorry, provocative, but I, uh, <laughs> and you, you invested your, your careers in this, but um, okay. <laughs> and, you know what? I'm sorry to say, but that's on my mind, and I'm, mm -hmm. I'm going to let you answer, okay? <laughs> Excuse me. We're not dead. Haven't you heard? We're the enemy of the people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We're going strong uh, over here. Yeah, yeah, Trump. I mean, it's, it's actually, I mean, the, the, it's an exciting time to be an entry-level journalist in New York uh, coming out of this school. Our, our career fair is, is um, bigger than ever. Um, you know, it's, the industry is obviously restructuring uh, very rapidly and has been disrupted. There has been a loss of journalism jobs in newspapers across the country, and that's the biggest crisis in both employment and in the, in the, in the role of journalism and civic health has been the loss of local news reporting. On the two coasts, there's been enormous investments, venture capital, digital first startups, and and a lot of legacy businesses in journalism that are still hugely profitable, like CNN or uh, the others, you know, in the New York Times, which is doing thriving here in New York City, um, they're restructuring. They're restructuring around digital first skills. They're restructuring around new sensibilities, new ways of storytelling. And so it's actually, um, you know, my generation of reporters from the analog age who know how to do, uh, grew up in newspapers, I spent 20 years at the Washington Post, you know, our generation is, is sometimes struggles to adjust to these restructurings, but your generation has enormous opportunity to thrive. Uh, can can I interrupt you, Steve? Um, I'm sorry, and then somebody else can. Uh, if I tell one of my friends, well, I went to um, an open house at uh, Columbia Graduate School of uh, Journalism, why would you go into that field right now? Um, you know, everything's on the internet. Can, can, and then I won't say anything else. Somebody else is behind me, okay? Okay, thank you. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a great... Um, uh, opportunity to live in the public square, to um, participate in the democratic function of holding powerful people and institutions accountable, to tell stories that are, aren't being told, 
to bring into our national discourse uh, the voices and the and the realities and the stories of of people and and places that are otherwise neglected it is a great life you get to live by your wits you get to ask impertinent questions you get to travel and discover you get to tell stories you also get to change what you're interested in from time to time you know it's a it's a it's a field where you can learn your whole life uh, and and through that uh, you know discover and contribute um, and frankly, the president has been very helpful to journalism. <laughs> I mean, he's really, you know, there was, when I first came here five years ago, six years ago, I, there were a lot of young people that I would meet in the classroom who were understandably a little bit confused about what journalism was anymore. And, you know, what is the, where is this going? And everybody has media in their pocket. And, and, uh, and now, you don't find uh, the last couple of classes have not had that confusion. Everyone is sitting up straight trying to figure out how you do this work in an environment like this. It's polarized where where journalists are being called out and where there's an enormous amount of uh, uh, in intensity around the function of reporting in some parts of the public square these days. But that's th those are questions our faculty loves to talk about because there are answers to how you, how you report uh, if you're person of color and you're covering a white nationalist rally, I mean, that's a serious set of questions that we spend time breaking down and talking about the methodologies of covering public protests, of being, you know, put in a cage and having people spit at you by the president and so forth. These are, these are very serious things to which there are methodological answers and, and lots of ways to, to really have success in this environment. And if I could add just one little point to <coughs> that. Uh, that makes me want to go to journalism school and like start over. <laughs> yeah, totally. Inspiring. Um, that you say, you, to friends who say, well, everything's on the internet, um, what do we need journalism for? I'd, I'd say because everything's on the internet, we need journalism. Because part of, part of what this school is about is how do you do reporting that's accurate, that's been verified, that is, you know, that we're certain is, um, is, is not false or uh, just some rumor that hasn't been properly investigated. So we, we are, are teaching to um, you know, high standards of principles of accuracy and thoroughness that you can't um, assume everything that anybody throws up on the internet is, um, is following. Yeah, forever. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, and just from a practical standpoint, you know, like any other, you know, industry, I have always believed, and it's still the case, that merit journalism is a wonderful meritocracy where if you work really hard and you really care, you will get ahead. But, you know, like any other industry, who you know <laughs> matters too. And who we know are people working at the highest level of journalism. And so part of your investment here is to become part of that network and to learn from these people and to knock on their doors and, uh, you know, um, it w uh, be become part of this community. Hi, uh, my name's Amy. Um, so I've worked, like, in and around journalism, but never actually in it like writing so I was just curious if when you're applying or even like through the course of the program if you have to pick sort of a medium that you want to work in specifically or a subject area that you want to focus on or if that sort of comes naturally throughout the year thanks I think it, it, it comes naturally throughout the year um, you you can come in I, I think one of the remarkable things about this uh, program that I've, I've seen is that um, it's intense. Uh, you learn a lot in a relatively short time. Uh, it's very mentoring focused. You have a lot of contact uh, with faculty. And students who come in with an initial conviction about what medium or what subject area they want to concentrate on may discover in two or three months something very different from what they expected. And there is plenty of time to pivot over the course of the year. And so we, I think, um, emphasize at the beginning of the school year to the incoming class keep your mind open through the first especially through the first nine weeks of reporting and as you move toward writing and and let yourself discover what you really love and and what what you really want to do and and it may it, many people have a pretty good idea and follow through but but a good number 
discover something they didn't know. Um, uh, and particularly in this day where, where there's lots of new kinds of storytelling and podcasting and audio and so forth, um, uh, you stumble over something that, that uh, you didn't know about before you got here and you discover that's really what you want to be. Okay. Quickly. I yes. I see that the admissions and financial aid portion is coming at the end, so please feel free to say if, that's, if this question is more relevant for that. But what, I, would be, I would be curious to hear what you all would say is the reason to invest financially in this program, um, especially f for people who may have a few experiences here and there and might be thinking, okay, if I just chug along for a little bit longer in the field, something might come about. Um. You know, it, I, it's, a, it's a very hard question to answer, you know, is it worth it, right? Um, that's a very individual question. I mean, I think what, what we can confidently say is that it's, um, th that we provide a great education in any of the tracks um, and the opportunity to work with, as, as Elena said, you know, people at the top of the field where you are developing also um, lifelong, like really lifelong um, relationships, comradeship with your, your cohort um, and, and becoming part of a community of professional journalists. Um, it's, you know, people ask me this a lot. It took me 10 years to pay off my own student loans from graduate school, so it's a question I don't take lightly. I mean, it's, you know, it, it, you really have to think about it and decide, and we can't, nobody can answer that for you. You know, all we can say is we can promise you a great opportunity here and, and, a, and a good education. And if you have financial need, as you'll hear about later, there'll be opportunities yeah. to apply for a scholarship. Uh, we have, you know, extraordinary resources to support people with genuine need and uh, to connect them to the school. And I would only add, uh, to Lisa's <laughs> great answer, that, you know, there are 12,000 addressable Columbia alumni in, in this uh, uh, world, and at, they're in every major news organization. The one thing that we do feel good about is that if you make the investment we, and you put the work in, we will lift you into this profession. Uh, it's, you know, you, and and um, the other uh, thing I sometimes think about is that when you look at where our alumni are, learning how to report, think, and write, sort of like going to law school, you know, it will take you lots of places. Um, I hope you'll spend your whole life in journalism, but I'm not one of those people who resents the fact that someone who learns how to report, think, and write um, at this school then goes out and uh, you know, makes a fortune on Wall Street. <laughs> those are alumni that I value because they <laughs> come in and offer scholarships to the rest of you. <laughs> uh, but uh, but they, they attribute to their journalism education the investigative and, and analytical skills that after five or ten years of being a reporter, they went and pursued in some other way. So it is a, it is a fungible uh, set of skills in a lot yeah. of ways. Absolutely. Okay, great. Steve, Elisa, Elena, thank you very much for taking the time to join us this morning. And um, I'd like to invite my student panelists to come on up. Come on up and have a seat. We've learned that um, it's actually better to have the panelists set their own name cards out um, because we often end up with <laughs> name cards that go awry. <laughs> <laughs> or people who have different intentions of where they should sit than what we had thought. So anyway, I am absolutely delighted to um, introduce you all to our student panelists who come from the United States, from across the world, are in several different programs here at the school. 
Um, and I'm going to let them just um, start and introduce themselves. They'll talk a little bit about why, what they were doing before they came to the journalism school, about what they thought about as they were making their decisions about um, graduate school. And of course, they were exactly where you are a year ago um, and thinking through all of these things. Um, and they'll also talk with you about their own experiences. Um, and I know that they will tell you exactly what it's like for them. Um, we will also have a period for questions at the end, um, so you can hold your questions. And for those of you uh, who are online, I know that David has been answering your questions on the chat, um, but if you have any particular questions that you would like um, him to ask for the whole group, um, just let him know that. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and start with Andre and ask you to, to Hello. start. Hello, everybody. My name is Andre. I'm in the, I'm in the part-time program. I'm a documentary concentration major, and <clears throat> I'm originally from Brazil. I grew up in Orlando, Florida. I went to film school in Boston, and that's kind of where I ended up doing journalism because I focused in on documentary filmmaking early on in my undergraduate years, and I really wanted to take that next step to be a much better documentary storyteller, so I decided going to journalism school is the best avenue for that, for that because at the core of a good documentarian is a good reporter and journalist. And I think that this is, is a really tough choice to come to Columbia because I'm, I have a full-time job and it's really difficult to do the part-time program. There are not a lot of us doing the part-time program in the documentary program. There's only two of us doing it right now. And it's really hectic. It's one of the toughest things I've ever done but I don't regret it for a second because it's just extremely rewarding. I mean, the people we get to work with are amazing. I was in Elena Cabral's reporting class and that gave me such a solid foundation to do what I'm doing now, which is working on my master thesis project. Um, one of our thesis advisors is Betsy West, who just released a documentary on Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And we get to hear from her and learn from her um, our professors are just astounding, and it's been an extremely rewarding experience so far for me personally. That's a little bit about me. Thank you, Andre. You're welcome. Angela. Hi, I'm Angela. I'm in the data program here. Um, it's the inaugural year of the program, so I wasn't really sure what to expect, but it's been amazing so far. Um, so I grew up in Utah um, in a small town, and I went to school uh, for my undergrad in the Chicago area at Northwestern, where I studied art history and studio art. Um, and after that, uh, I ended up working in media in New York. Um, I worked at BuzzFeed on the editorial and the business side. And right before coming here, I was working in advertising um, at Gizmodo. And on the side, I was freelancing. Um, and I really wanted to make that my full-time uh, career. So that's why I decided to do journalism school. And I had never taken a journalism class. I would never taken a writing class. Um, and I just felt like something was missing from my skill set. And while I was researching programs here, I discovered the data program. Um, and I just thought, why not? Um, it was the only program I applied to. And I really didn't know what to expect. but. So far, it's succeeded, um, you know, all of my expectations. Over the summer, you learn coding, um, Python. Uh, you learn how to work with different kinds of data. Um, it's really intensive. Um, it's really awesome, and the professors are amazing. I've gone to a couple of different coding events in New York City at other universities, and I have to say that they've been really confusing compared to the instruction that we've had here. So, yeah, and yeah. Great, thank you. Hi, I'm Urvija Banerjee. I'm a student in the MA program in the Arts and Culture concentration, so Elisa's concentration. Um, I'm originally from Singapore. I grew up there pretty much when I was a teenager. I knew I wanted to be a journalist. I interned at the Straits Times, which is the Singapore newspaper. Uh, and then I came here for college. I went to Princeton. I was an English major there. Uh, and I was also all four years on the student newspaper. I was an editor. And it was like a full-time job, basically. We spent like 40 hours a week in the newsroom, the Daily Princetonian. Um, and that really sort of is where I learned the foundation for, you know, a lot of the skills that I have today as a reporter. Um, and a lot of the journalistic ethics as well I picked up in that newsroom. And 
I worked in PR for a little bit after I graduated in New York and I knew it wasn't for me. Um, and I, I ended up doing an editorial fe fellowship at Atlas Obscura. Uh, they still do it, it's great. Um, and that was sort of when I realized I really wanted to change track and become a full-time journalist. Um, and then I moved to India for a couple of years. I worked at Rolling Stone there, um, wrote about music, really you know, realized I wanted to write about art for a living. Um, and then I didn't write about art for another six months. I was a features editor at a health uh, and women's magazine in India. Um, and then I came here. Um, and I did, I did have that question of whether it's worth it, for sure. And um, the first thing I will say is that they are really generous with their scholarships, especially in the MA program. Um, and the other, th the other question I had was whether to apply for the MA or the MS. I am a little young for the MA program. Um, I think I'm on the, on the younger side for the MA program. And what I want to say is that if you have any question at all about which one to apply to, apply to both. Like they, they give you the, I, th I think they still have the option to do that. And like, I, I really recommend doing that because you never know, you know, like if you feel like you've had, if you've built up the experience that you need to be a reporter in a newsroom, I, I don't see why you shouldn't go out for the MA program just, and you know, if they feel like you're not right for it, you'll probably get into the MS program instead of the MA program. But yeah, that's what, that's what I mean. And I would also add to that, that if you are not sure whether the MS or the MA program is the appropriate program for you, please email us, give us a call in the admissions office. Um, we will talk with you about what your prior experience in education um, is like, your prior experience in journalism, and we're usually able to judge pretty well which people belong in the MA, which people belong in the MS, and which people are right there on the cusp. So always feel free to ask. Yeah. Andre, maybe you would like to talk a little bit more about um, the process that you're going through right now in learning how to do documentary filmmaking yeah, from absolutely. a journalistic perspective. And I say that too because Columbia University has two documentary film programs. We have a journalism program and then there's also an MFA program at the School of the Arts. Um, and so we concentrate on journalistic documentary filmmaking. So, Andre. Yeah, that's, um, that's something I had to kind of contend with before I applied because I really, I went to Emerson College to do film uh, during my undergrad. And after I graduated, I worked on a few documentary productions. I was interning at documentary studi uh, studios with filmmakers. Um, I got a chance to work on a feature film. Um, and so I was really thinking maybe an MFA would make sense. But I think what I was missing wasn't what the MFA program could give me, which is sort of more of the technical skills, more of the artistic mastery. I think what I needed was to be a better writer, a better reporter. I wanted to be able to tell more compelling stories. And in order to do that, I th I wanted to learn how to find those stories more effectively as a journalist. Um, and so I really thought the journalism school made sense. And so far, it's been exactly what I wanted to get, from both from the reporting class, which kind of gives you those initial skills and the ability to go out there, talk to people, find sources. And also in the documentary program, we kind of really hone in on writing good pitches, which is an art in of itself, in kind of crafting your story, um, finding good subjects, what, what makes a compelling subject, how compelling stories are told. These are all things that I think I could only get from a journalism institution, not necessarily from an MFA. Um, yeah. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Angela, maybe you could talk a little bit more about the um, data courses that the data students do over the summer. Dean Calls covered the curriculum in the, the fall and the spring for the Master of Science students, but I know people are all, are always sometimes concerned about those data courses in the summer, um, especially if they don't have any data background. Yeah, so I actually had zero programming experience. Um, I had no experience with data prior to this, so I was a little apprehensive as well. Um, the program is designed for people who don't have that kind of experience. I would say the majority of people um, in the program, there are 10 of us, um, came in with virtually no coding or data skills. 
Um, and over the summer, you take uh, these classes with the LEAD program. Um, it's sort of like a programming boot camp for journalists here. Um, it's either for the summer or they can do a six-month thing. Uh, so that's also something to consider if you just want to learn um, programming skills that are applicable to journalism. Um, yeah, the summer was very intense. Uh, it's basically like a full-time job. It's nine to five every day. Um, and the entire time you're just learning how to work with data, you're learning SQL, um, you're learning Python, uh, you learn some visualization skills. So if any of you are interested in like mapping um, or creating data visualizations, interactives, um, this is a great place to do it. And uh, I would say that actually, maybe one of the best things about having everything sort of front loaded in the summer is that the fall feels pretty good in comparison. Um, it's been a lot easier to manage my time uh, this semester and yeah and I agree with everything that Andre said as well I think it applies to the data program for sure great and Orvija I'd like you to talk a little bit more about the kinds of things that you're doing in the seminar and evidence and inference classes in the MA program Great. So the seminar meets twice a week, um, which is more than any of your other classes meet. So you spend a lot more time in that class. And I would say I work more for that class as well. It really is the meat of this program for me. And it's because I've learned so, so much. I like I was telling my parents the other day, I walk into an art museum now and I, all of the pieces look different to me at MoMA than they did before I took this, like before I started this program three months ago. Um, we basically do a grounding in all of modern art and the theory behind it and philosophy that goes into modern art. We also talk a lot about culture and we do a lot of really hands-on things in connection to that learning. Like we were covering um, the French Institute's festival Crossing the Line earlier this year and we all went to like five events um, and got to really get to know the festival directors and the performers, and we had like this great behind the scenes access. Um, it doesn't really matter that you're not affiliated to a publication. Um, the fact that you're at the journalism school opens a lot of these doors, which has been really great. It means that there's been a lot of learning in the classroom, as Elisa was saying. We do um, engage a lot with the material that we read every week for class, but there's also a lot of really cool events that I would, like I lived in New York before, and I'm seeing a completely different side of it now. Um, going to these really, really interesting events. Um, and with evidence and inference, I've actually, I've really, it's sort of like a, it's more of a meta class in that it really makes you think a lot about what you do as a journalist in comparison to like a social scientist, for example. And it really makes you question stuff that you take for granted as fact. Um, which I think is really interesting, even if you're an arts reporter like I am, um, because there are facts in everything that you write as a journalist. And, you know, it really makes me think twice about whether I'm taking this expert, um, you know, like at first at face value, like whether I should go back and double check what this person is saying to me. And we also do a lot of really cool hands on things for this class. Um, a couple months ago, I spent like four hours at this art shop in, uh, in Bushwick. Uh, doing like this ethnographic assignment where you basically just observe, which is kind of hard as a journalist. Um, we're supposed to be observers, but we also, a we ask a lot of questions. That's what we do. But social scientists, they have this thing called an ethnographic survey where they just literally sit there and they look at what's going on and they don't take any of the patterns that you see for granted in everyday life, which I think is really useful as a journalist. I think there's a lot that we do take for granted. Um, and this course has really helped me question some of those things. Great, thank you. Um, I am being mindful of our time and I know that a lot of people have questions for the students so I would like to invite you to come up to the microphone um, and ask your questions. Hi, my name is uh, Lucas Woods. Um, questions for Andre. Yeah. Did you submit a doc for in your application? Did you submit a documentary piece? I did. And the uh, my question is about the uh, time constraints there. Did you happen to take a piece and cut it down and just submit a clip? So I made a reel. So I took sort of the highlights from a number of pieces that I've worked with and cut it down to about like five minutes. I think anything going after that is like right. going on too long. 
Um, so you just want to make kind of a best of reel of some of the things you've been working on. Awesome. Thank you. You're welcome. And it's also for documentary, I'll just mention it right now. It is not, you don't have to have done video or documentary work before, just as with the data program, you don't have to have data experience. Um, and so if, if you have any questions about the kinds of clips, if you're going to be applying to documentary, um, give us a call with your questions. But um, when you think about coming to any of the MS programs, really, you don't have to have experience. That's why you want to come to journalism school. Yeah, I just want to back that up because I did come in with some technical experience, but that's not the case for everybody in my class. In fact, I feel like I'm relearning a lot of things now that I've missed out in my undergraduate years or really focusing in. And I mean, it's just been really foundational right now. So Christine's absolutely correct. You don't need to have video experience per se. Great. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, my name is Brandon, and my question is for Angela. Um, as a data journalism specialist, are you limited in the types of stories you can tell with an emphasis being required on the data component? Um, I would say absolutely not. Uh, I've been able to write about various things that I'm interested in. I think one of the great things about data is that you can really apply it to anything. Um, you can find great data in food reporting, climate, politics, virtually anything you, I think, could, would normally report on. Um, as a non-data reporter, you could bring a data lens to that. Thank you. My question is also for you, Angela. Uh, my name is Sarah. So within your studies right now with the data concentration, you kind of came, you mentioned that you went into it with a kind of why not attitude. So my question in kind of having the same logic right now is what do you plan on doing after graduation with this concentration? Yeah, so um, I haven't decided if I want to focus more on a front end uh, career. Um, so doing more visualizations or more reporting and analysis. I think my ideal job would be something that combines the two. Um, it just may not be the case at some legacy media organizations where they tend to have people focused on one, uh, one thing or the other. Um, I do think that there are a lot of jobs in this field um, and more so, so more every day. So yeah, I don't know if that was helpful. But it was, thank you. Um, hi. Uh, I'm not sure if any of um, you might be able to answer this because this is kind of out of the realm of what we've talked about so far, but um, I hope maybe give it a shot. Um, I'm curious um, if the grounding of what you're learning is strictly um, US based because I've done a lot of work abroad and um, speak Arabic and Chinese and I'm hoping to use those skills in a journalistic capacity beyond my prior experience and I'm wondering if y'all have been able to deepen and develop that understanding while here, perhaps learning how to um, work better with a translator or um, do your own work individually with sources in a different cultural context. Um, and if for data, um, if you're able to work in different languages with data, I have absolutely no background in data, but um, I'd love to hear a little bit about that. Thank you. Um, just for the data part of the question, uh, six out of the ten of us are international students, um, and so they they do work with data in other languages. And the director of the program, Giannina Sagnini, um, who worked on the Panama Papers, she teaches a class uh, called Investigating Across Borders, um, and I think that's exactly what you're interested in. So just Thank something you. to look into. For the MA program, um, the the thesis that you do could be anywhere in the world. So okay. I have a lot of classmates who are actually going abroad for that. So that's one way in which you get to report in a different cultural context and you get the funding for it, which is amazing. Um, and also, I mean, most of my classmates are, or I mean, Dean Suter's probably has the, the, the statistics on this. It's about 60% internationals so um for the ma program exactly so most of us have some sort of background in reporting abroad um and so i think that the people who design the program certainly elisa is very aware of this and makes sure that what we're learning is not just specific to a u.s context excellent in the documentary context uh, like everybody else a big portion of our class are international students Almost everybody speaks a second language. And uh, in fact, the outgoing class 
a number of the documentaries were produced abroad. They traveled okay. to tell their stories, which is it's tough to do in the documentary program because they're very limited in time and budget, but people still do it because it's worth doing and Columbia gives you a lot of support to do that. So it's definitely possible. Great. I'm thrilled to hear all of y'all's answers. <laughs> Thanks. You're welcome. I would also add to that um, that there are a lot of discussions that happen in the classroom because ab about a third of our students overall come from outside of the United States. And certainly many of our students who come from the United States, from Canada, um, from the UK, also come from migration backgrounds and um, often speak other languages. Um, and so there are, and we also recognize that journalism is practiced in different ways in other countries. And so that kind of discussion is very important to what we do in the classroom as well. John. We actually have a couple questions from the live stream, which we think would be relevant for everybody. Um, they're both for Andre, actually. So the first is from Leanne Herder. Um, she says she's, she is interested in the um, MS part-time program as well, only uh, she's interested in the investigative journalism. And she'd like to get a sense of the time commitment per week, classes, homework, etc. It's a lot. Um, it's <laughs> very heavy. Um, I mean, we meet, the documentary class meets twice a week. Uh, for three hours each day so that's six hours of your week um, and it's very project based and each project you're going out and you're filming um, and that takes a significant amount of work I mean to edit a three to five minute piece takes at least 10 to 12 hours so you can't it's not you can't phone it in you have to really plan your week out so if you're gonna focus in like do an investigative um, concentration or documentary um, you need to make sure that your employer is aware that you're doing this my employer knows that I'm doing this I very frequently have to request some time off to go report to shoot and they have to be okay with that so it's it is something that you have to be aware and that's there's a reason why there's only two part-timers doing a concentration because I work at Columbia so I'm very fortunate that I get to kind of come in here and it's not a big commute for me so it works with my schedule but you have to be very cautious because it's extremely time consuming thank you cool. and the second one is from Kevin Trong um, he's interested in the video journalism but not necessarily documentary filmmaking are most of the students in the documentary specialization specifically filmmakers or do they do video as well um, that's a tough one so we're not working in like film. <laughs> we're all kind of doing video. Um, we're not shooting in like 16 millimeter film or anything like that. But filmmaker is just sort of like a broad term mm -hmm. for storytellers in visual media form. Um, but we did have a student who started out as a documentary filmmaker and kind of felt like the program was a little bit too intensive, wasn't working well with uh, their schedule. So they moved to video to focus in on video as an MS student. So you can do that. You can't start as a documentary filmmaker. And if you don't, if you feel like this is too much or you have other interests, if you, you can opt out early enough and just kind of concentrate on video. And like the investigative, the Stabile program, I think you can kind of craft a program where you're focusing in on video, but you're not fully doubling down on documentary and where that takes up like your entire time as like what I'm doing right now. Right. You can do that. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, I'm Sharon. Uh, this is more of a general question uh, for any of you all. What kinds of things did you include in your application to make yourself stand out? Did you focus on like one thing or the other? Were the essays or the journalistic pieces? Just love to know or find a common thread. Thank you. Okay, I guess I'll start. Um, so I had already, you know, built up a portfolio of pieces, so I didn't really focus on that. I just included the ones that I thought were my best work, which obviously you should do. Um, but I love writing essays. I'm a total weirdo. Um, and so I focused a lot on making the essays the best that they could be. Um, and I had fun with them. Um, there's one that's the autobiographical essay, which I, I had a lot of fun with. And I wanted to include things in that essay that would show my cap capabilities as an arts and culture reporter. So I wrote a lot about my interests and in hobbies within the arts. Uh, kind of similar for me, I just wanted to focus on 
um, rather than describing my skills in my essays, more to demonstrate my writing ability. Um, I actually made the decision to apply here about 10 days before the deadline, so I spent that entire 10 days going over and over my essays. Um, and for the data component in particular, uh, I think it was helpful just to describe my interest in like technology and um, I think even if you have skills in like forums like posting on Reddit like you pick up some things that can be used in data um, just by formatting your comments and stuff. Um, I also kind of applied a little bit close to the deadline because I was really unsure but um, I didn't have a lot of writing pieces. I w wasn't a journal of sort of reporter journalist. I worked in public access television. I had a lot of video experience, but I didn't have a lot of writing. And in fact, that's kind of what I really wanted to get out of the school. So I honed in on the fact that kind of in that lack that I didn't have a lot of writing because that's exactly where I wanted Columbia to fill in as I wanted to be a better writer and a better reporter. Um, and so I had a lot of academic writing because I did a lot of like, um, I was a post-colonial studies minor and I did a lot of kind of research on that. And so I included those pieces of writing, my more academic writing. And I also feel like my personal story is something that inspired me and has brought me to where I am today. So I really focused in on my immigrant story in the United States and what that was like and how that shaped my interest in documentary filmmaking. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, uh, I'm Jack. It's very comforting to hear how close to the deadline some of you decided to apply. <laughs> um, my question is kind of the flip side of the one that was for Andre, which is in the full-time programs, how do you or do you mix in other part-time or freelance work at all? Like, how, how does that fit in? Sorry, Andre, if this doesn't include you in the answers. <laughs> Um, for me, I did feel like I was taking a gamble by doing this program because I had a pretty decent and stable job before this. Um, but I've been able to, I've just been trying to pitch some of my assignments and I've been successful and I think that's probably what you should do. You can build your portfolio. Um, yeah, and like, yeah. <laughs> This sort of answers your question. Um, I'm not a US citizen, so I am not technically allowed to pitch my work and have it be published right now. Um, I can do that once the program ends, but I will say that I am collecting an incredible portfolio of clips and that my classmates are pitching those out and are successful in pitching those out usually. Um, I've just built up a great body of work in the last three months that I'm definitely going to pitch out when I'm done with the program. It's also okay. super helpful to have uh, the professors that are here because they essentially serve as your editors before an editor in the real world sees it. And sometimes they help you get, get published as well. Mm. Fantastic, thank you. I will also mention that we, we know that students do pitch their work and are doing work, um, you need to be careful um, because I think t one of the things that every student talks about is time management um, and your focus is your work at the school. The faculty, while they will help you with these kinds of things, um, they are also not interested in hearing that you had a deadline for a work deadline and that for that reason you were not able to turn in your work on time here. Um, so that's just something to kind of keep in mind that you want to make sure that um, you keep yourself kind of balanced in that regard. So, okay, well, thank you all so, so much. Um, again, for coming in on a Saturday morning, um, for all of your insight, thoughts, suggestions. Um, we are going to um, move right ahead. Um, you guys, I hope you'll grab some food on the way out um, because I see that this group is not eating enough. <laughs> Students here are always ready to have something to eat. Um, that might be a, you know, something that we'll look for in your applications. <laughs> no, not really. Um, but I, as our students leave, I'm going to invite uh, Gina Bubian, who is our Director of Career Services, who I think is going to be able to answer some of the other questions that some of you have brought up um, a little bit earlier. Um, and so Gina, please join us.
Good morning. So while I'm figuring out the, the tech situation, why don't you stand up and stretch your bones? Um, and this will take about one minute. Uh, okay. Yeah. As soon as you get, grab a croissant, just come right back so we can get started. <laughs> Hope it's not too dark. I just needed the lights dim so you can see my snazzy visuals. Well, while we're waiting for everybody to come back to their seats, I just want to quickly, well, I'm Gina Bubion, and I'm part of a, a really small team, um, but we're very effective, don't worry, uh, that works with the students one-on-one. -on -one. And while, before I start officially, I just want to address some of those questions right now before I forget. So the part-time versus full-time program, you should know that from the employer's point of view, employers don't differentiate, um, and, and the students definitely do mix. From our, our office, we, we try to plan events throughout the week, throughout the day, different times of day with the part-time students in mind so that they can make some of, some of our events. Um, and then there was a question about a question to Angela Wang about you know what what kind of data do you want to do and that really is something that the, the data students are get here and fig, try to figure out I know at the very largest news organizations you kind of have to choose whether you're going to be sort of a data journalist slash investigative reporter or a data visual visual you know data visualization um, person on like a graphics team so but a lot of newspapers and and websites and and broadcast companies definitely want those skills so you know the program is, is where you sort of figure out what you're better at um, and what you enjoy more they're definitely sort of a different um, kind of track um, Angela is super artistic so she's you know she's got you know like a vis very strong visual sense um, some of the other students are just really investigative and just want to learn how to dig through data um, so we, I can answer other questions as well. So why don't I just get started because I know we're on a, a time schedule here. So uh, we guide our students from day one to help you get situated by the time graduation comes around. Uh, we do one-on-one -on -one advising. We bring in all the major employers um, in the journalism industry into the school. They come interview our students. Um, we bring in a, a lot of alums will drop in uh, throughout the year and talk to students about their careers and what they've done since they graduated. Um, and it's just a very strong sort of networking culture here. Uh, we also put on the Career Expo, which this, the pictures here are of the Career Expo. And this is, has become the very biggest journalism job fair in the country. And last, last April, we had about 150 companies present, and they brought like a total of 300 recruiters. And the recruiters are mostly editors, um, reporters, uh, section editors, also um, HR professionals, people on the 
HR side. So we, we had about 300 students in attending, so it was really good odds. It's a really busy day. Uh, students interview with, t with 15 to 20 companies, and um, we prepare you so well for the expo. And as a result, um, a lot of job offers and internship offers and thesis buys and, and master's project buys happen out of the expo. So uh, the, the coming expo is, is March um, 29th, so we're already beginning to plan for that. So here's first the reality check. We, we never know what the job market is going to look like at the end of the year. We're, we're Every year we're stressed out. It's like, what's going to happen this year? And every year the journalism students do fine. Um, but because what's, it's a very dynamic, very changing industry, and we don't know which companies are going to figure out how to make money by the end of the year. We don't know which are going to bite the dust. We don't know which are going to add, uh, you know, add different verticals. Or, or sort of decide to add, you know, a podcast component. We don't know what new nonprofit is going to spring up with major funding. It's just so, so dynamic. Uh, it makes it for a really exciting, nerve-wracking for us, but exciting for the students and also nerve-wracking for the students. Um, but at the end of the year, by when all is said and done, the J School, the, the Columbia education is really powerful, and the alumni network is really powerful, and our students weather every storm. I've been here for 12 years. There was a recession in 2008, and yet, and yet our students sort of main, maintained their hold. In, in the industry and got all the best jobs, and so it, so it seemed, seemed to us, definitely. So now I'm gonna show you some, some granular statistics on how the, stu the class of 2008 uh, did in the job market, and these figures are as of graduation. So I like to show this chart because it's extremely um, honest. And basically, as of, as of June 8th, which is a couple weeks after graduation when we corral all this data and crunch it, um, about 74% of the students had something lined up. And then with each passing week of summer, which is not in this chart, that number sort of creeps up. But what I love about this chart is it shows you in, in very pure, uh, strict terms terms how dominant internships are amongst the graduating class. And this is not a new thing. This is not a Columbia trend. This is something that has been in the industry for a long, long, long time. Even when I was in journalism school like decades ago, it was the same thing. Um, because in journalism is an industry where there's this very vibrant internship culture, I mean paid internship culture, where the uh, e editors want to give you a trial run during the summer. People in the newsroom go on vacation during the summer, so they need interns. Um, and so this is, you know, it's not like internships in England that are like one week long and they might hand you a broom and tell you to sweep. It's not like that. Internships here are the real deal. You are expected to step up to the plate, crank out the news, help put out the paper, help put, help put out the website. So it's, um, internships are not a bad thing. We like them. It's kind of your, your big chance to land at the Washington Post or the Wall Street Journal like right after graduation. So that's why we love internships and why our students uh, take the applications really seriously throughout the year. A big chunk of the students do get full-time jobs. Those those jobs are going to come later in the year because employers sort of wait until the last second to post a job, interview people. That's just how journalism is. It's not like the law school where you're interviewing and you know freshman year and you stick with that same company. Um, it's not like the business school. This is journalism. Editors are constantly on deadline, just constantly needing help yesterday and posting jobs. So that's why uh, you know the job. The jo if you're looking for a job, kind of happens later in the year. Um, so we are continuing to hear from our students um, where they've landed and I just heard uh, just this week one of the um, two uh, students landed full-time jobs and sponsorship, which is important for our some of our international students, at Euromoney Institutional Investor, which is a niche publication that leads to sort of bigger financial news organizations. One of, one of the students was an MA politics student from Italy, and she's covering legal affairs for Euromoney. And the other student was uh, an MS student from Canada, who um, I'm not exactly sure what her beat is, but she accepted a, a full-time job as well this, this week. Another Indian student um, in the MS program just found out that her internship at CNN in Atlanta is being extended through for the entire duration of her OPT year. And so she's excited about that because now she's got something set up until like next August. Um, 
a student uh, who interned at the Wall Street Journal uh, was plugged into a like a six month long extension type of period. I think she's filling in for someone on maternity leave, and she's covering you know politics and and um, in New Jersey and, and New York. And so these these sort of part time jobs or these extensions are are are, are common at some of the bigger organizations, and it's kind of a way for these companies to keep you sort of in in the the wheelhouse of the company until a full-time job comes along and then they plug you in that's sort of the the routine that we see that we see happen so that's just lately okay the next chart i'm going to show you is a chart that shows you like what what employers are looking for in our students and i do not believe this is particular to columbia this is um employers have been looking for the same thing for a hundred years in journalism and it's reporting it's re it's text reporting and writing and so what this chart is showing you th um, is that most of our students tell us at the end of the year that they've been hired to be text print reporters or or and you know doing reporting um, the second most common job main job duty is video and audio production broadcast production and this is as you can see has been the case for years um, and the data journalism sort of component of, of that chart is going to be growing because there are more students in that program now. Is anybody here interested in on-air reporting? Local news? Okay, so the reason why that number is small, I like to just point out, the on-air, the, the sort of small broadcast companies across the country, they don't have a vibrant sort of system of internships. They just hire people full-time. And so that is a process that sort of... Um, gets taken care of at graduation or like right or within the summer within the couple months of summer you know the, so the students who want to do on-air reporting are finishing their reels they're sticking around after graduation to like or you know as as graduation is pending finishing their reels sending it out all over the place and then going for interviews so that's why we have plenty of students who are doing local news reporting across the country but it's not quite reflected in this in this table just because of it's their full-time jobs that people are getting okay so here's what's really interesting um, this is where students are landing platform wise okay so this chart shows you that it, it sort of is, is intuitive. We all know that digital only has been on the rise, and that yellow line at the top is what that is what you're seeing. You're seeing sort of the inexorable rise of digital only um, platform, and you're also seeing the inexorable fall of magazine. That's the green line. Okay, um, the yellow and or the, the the orange and red lines are. Uh, the broadcast platform jobs and the newspaper platform jobs. And they, they have been topsy-turvy, bouncing around like crazy since at least 2010. It's actually early, earlier than that. So um, this chart is interesting because it, I mean, it, it shows basically that 80, if you, if you can see the, the st stats on the back end, it's 80% of all the students are either landing in digital only, broadcast, or uh, video and audio production platforms okay the brown line at the bottom that's wire service jobs and that that sort of that's kind of stayed stable over time uh, the students who get wire service jobs are going to places like Reuters as Agence France press um, Bloomberg Wall Street Journal and these are the these are the companies that have the hundreds of bureaus worldwide um, and the Associated Press most of those wire services are all about business journalism so if you burn with passion to be a foreign correspondent you might want to consider just embracing business journalism because that's going to sort of be your your ticket uh, more sort of um, uh, Sure, assuredly than say what you want to be a conflict re reporter um, so uh, so that's so that's where where we're seeing students students going okay all right the Columbia brand is pretty powerful it's such that they're that the biggest news organizations hire not just one but a bunch of students every year and this this is what I'm trying to, to show you here that seven people went to Reuters after graduation and the class of out of the class of 2018 and and six each at Bloomberg and PR and so forth um, and again these numbers continued to uh, tick up through, throughout the summer 
as you're considering other schools, I would suggest that you um, go on LinkedIn and do some counting, do some research, enter, you know, go to the school's website and just type in your dream publications or the, or the cities where you want to work and see where people are working. So this is what I, was, I did for LinkedIn. If you, and you can do this. It's not a restricted page. Go to the Columbia Journalism School's LinkedIn and there's a, an alumni button and you can see, you can do your own searching and see where, peop where people are landing. So I would encourage you to, to do this. Uh, when, I, when I was doing this quick count, um, I wasn't including students in the LEAD program uh, because it's not a degree program. I wasn't including bloggers or, or freelancers. I was just looking at like at full-time full jobs or, or sort of contract positions. And I was looking only at graduates of the MS program or the MA program or the Knight, or the Knight Badger program. I wasn't looking at the Columbia Publishing course or um, the, lead, the LEAD program. So. Um, once again, like as you're doing your research, you, this is all public information, you can do this and you can also um, look for employment statistics on various schools' websites. Uh, they will have some kind of sense of where their students land. I've, told, I've showed you our, our statistics, but you need to interrogate that data. I, um, our data is gathered as of graduation period um, and we have 100% of the class included in our count and these are things that you should you should be looking for as you look at other other schools data the percentage of students in the data when they take their measure um, and 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 who's and who's in it so um, I want to show you just some recent graduate work so Deanna was a summer intern at the Washington Post this summer and she had some freelance work but she but her main sort of calling court card was she was a Bro uh, Brooklyn D ADA a t a t assistant district attorney for like six or seven years before Columbia her specialty was um, was special cro special um, victims unit and um, domestic violence and so they hired her and then uh, they kept her af after the end of summer and they have been using her to write anything legal it's she's just been having a ball and um, I don't believe she's in a full-time job quite yet but they they keep they keep on keeping her so we're hoping that they just kind of forget that she was an intern and just make her full time but she's been she's just you can you google her name she's had a phenomenal run um, and Menke's son was an was an MA, MS, MA student in the business concentration who went to Tufts undergrad she had some internships before Columbia but she um, she was hired as as the, a, a summer intern at the Wall Street Journal and they hired her full-time after graduation and she and uh, and she's ha ha also ha having a ball um, this story is not by a recent grad she graduated a few years ago but I wanted to show it to you because it landed in my inbox a couple weeks ago and I thought it was a great story um, so frontline is a company that is is like the executive producer is a J school grad and the um, the founder and editor of ground truth project is also a J school grad and uh, and we have an exclusive year-long fellowship at Frontline that one of our students um, gets every year or two of our students um, and, and Katie was one of the students who got that and she's still continuing to report on on uh, on climate change and anyway this is a really interesting story about um, about uh, climate change denier textbook writers getting their books into the hands of school children across the country. Um, it's, it's really interesting. It was a part of a series. Um, this is a story by a student who was a part-time student who was working at Columbia at the School of Public Health and he uh, quit that job in order to take an internship at The Trace, which is a a long-form narrative sort of investigative website devoted to covering gun issues and they have said set recently sent him to Flint to report on on crime and and, and um, in, in Flint Michigan and I thought it was a, a great story so I thought I would show you that um, and this is just something a little bit lighter but our students really like working at courts courts is part of Atlantic media 
and um, Aisha was a, a grad from the last um, class of 2018, um, student, uh, a citizen of Malaysia, who was kept after the year. She, 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 I think she's being sponsored. She's either being sponsored full time or, or she's staying for the duration of her OPT year. I'm not quite sure on on the status of that. But she's been having a lot of fun just doing, you know, basically whatever she want, wants to do. Okay, this happened earlier in the year, but I'm really proud of it, so I'm showing it to you. So, uh, do you recall a story that went viral last year <laughs> about the Motel Sixes, the Motel Six in Phoenix that was calling ICE every time um, Mexican I immigrants checked in to the hotel? That was our students. This story went viral, and Antonia and Joseph were both just staking out Motel Sixes all over Phoenix and just really great shoe leather journalism, investigative journalism. Antonia was the class of 2016. She was uh, a, grad, a graduate of Hamilton College. Joe was a, uh, was the valedictor valedictorian of the class of, of 2017, and he was a Middlebury grad who didn't have much journalism experience, and they teamed up and won the Polk Award, which is a, a really prestigious prize. And Antonia, this summer, was hired away by the Washington Post. The Washington Post has noticed that there's a lot of really good investigative reporting happening at the alt weeklies, and so um, that, that's what the Phoenix New Times is, is alternative weekly, I, is, I mean to say, and so, um, and that's what happened to her. It's funny though, the other student mentioned in this story, Maria Perez, also a J school grad, um, she went to the F Naples Daily News, she's from Spain, she arrived in South Florida without a driver's license or knowing how to drive, and she learned how to drive because she wanted a job. And um, and so that, that's where she's just been tearing it up, winning investigative awards ever since. I thought it would be fun to show you some, tra some career trajectories of students. So these are recent students, and, and um, I just want to run through them for you. So Alexandria was, uh, was, uh, went to Cal State <coughs> Fullerton. She went to a t worked at a tiny paper in Pacific Palisades, California. I don't even believe it was a daily. And, but she was doing really good work, and she came here, and then she entered at the Miami Herald, and then she became an education reporter at the Asheville Citizen Times. She was just really dying for a an adventure, and she got to Asheville, which is in which is in the um, north cor uh, west corner of North Carolina, and she has she's been covering um, the opioid crisis and a variety of stories, and is really having a good experience. Sarah um, went to Berkeley. She came here. She was she was a freelance fixer for numerous publications in Turkey. She came to Columbia, and then she was eventually hired full-time at, at Reuters. Um, Anade was, I believe she was from South, South Africa, and she was working for a small dock company there, and she came here, and now she's uh, full-time at, at Al Jazeera. And Anna was a, um, an MA politics student who was a reporter at um, in Russia, and she came here, and first she got the Coindesk internship. Coindesk covers cryptocurrency, and it's a really hot publication. It gets quoted, quoted a lot by the um, in the press and now she's full-time and th and they're going to sponsor her so she's pretty excited she took a spring class on on uh, uh, cybersecurity and it touched on cryptocurrency over at SEPA during her second semester of um, of her MA um, program okay we also get a bunch of career changers here and um, this is for uh, this is interesting um, to know because it's just it's just the schools really um, varied and it's the student body is really interesting so Brian sold townhouses in Manhattan for 10 years before he was in, uh, in uh, came to Columbia he went to GW and um, he just really decided he wanted to be a journalist and he got hired at Business Insider and that's a, a six-month fellowship and so he's still in that um, Jamie was uh, a, a producer in Houston and then she kind of went into teaching and an SAT prep and she was a teacher for quite a while she decided she missed journalism and she came back to Columbia to sort of get back on track and now she's a, um, a reporter in Illinois. Andrew um, was working for the fleet that um, he was sort of steering a ship I don't really know the terminology in military terms but he was working in the in the Mediterranean and he uh, came to Columbia and then he went to the South China Morning Post which has really good editors and um, and our students like like to, to to try to try out that experience and now he's in the year-long fellowship at the Columbia Journalism Review and then Tori was um, researching. She was like a, you know, uh, more of an art historian type of, of um, background before Columbia. She came here. 
and um, had uh, several jobs trying to find out what she wanted to do. So she came here and then she went to Agence France Press, which has a lot of internships that aren't particularly well paid. But if you pay your dues, they oftentimes will find a place for you. And so that's what happened with, with Tori. And now she's a full-time um, uh, desk editor at AFP. And then, uh, so these are recent, recent grads. Jennifer um, was the Canadian I mentioned earlier who just got hired full-time at an era money institutional investor. Um, Catherine was, you know, she was editor in chief of her Haverford paper, of the Haverford paper. She was, you know, captain of the track team. She had a couple internships, um, and then she got hired at, at Bloomberg. Uh, Jing was a film student at Yale. He was um, into sort of, you know, f fiction and feature films, more sort of artsy kinds of kind of films. He came here to sort of switch gears and, and get more of a non-fiction, you know, journalism background. And now he, he's been hired full time at the Christian Science Monitor. They decided to sponsor him. And the Christian Science Monitor is based in Boston. And Katrina is, um, went to uh, St. Joe's and she was a news editor. Most of our students are involved in their student newspaper in some extent, to some extent, um, in undergrad. And then they come here and now she's at, at C, uh, CBS News. So that's all I kind of had for you. Uh, if, if I'm ready to take questions about anything having to do with the job market, if anybody's curious. Don't be shy. Uh, hi, Hello. my name is Dan. Hi. Um, so I noticed that there were about 75 students when graduation happened that didn't have anything lined up yet yes. just from like an advice perspective what like what was you generally the reason why they didn't have anything lined up compared to to those who did it's so complicated um, some of them are MA students who are looking for just higher level jobs and so it takes a while for that to, to sort of happen. Um, and some are ha, ha, never came to visit us. There's a section of students who just blow us off all year and then they come in and we help them with their materials or whatever. Um, some students decide that they need to take time off for personal reasons. There's always a couple weddings, a couple, like a baby gets born. There's stuff, you know, life happens. The students are adults. Um, the average age is what, 28 or so, 27. So yeah, so I mean, people do a variety of things. And we work with people, I mean, we really feel beholden to the class. I mean, we're, we're working all summer help, helping students. Okay, thanks. That's true. Well, some go into graduate pr other graduate programs, but they're already like in, in, those, in the pie chart that I just showed you. Hi, my name is Himong. Uh, I uh, just had a question kind of comparing the data journalism program uh, with kind of graduates of the dual degree program in journalism and computer science. Uh, I know y there may be st some more statistics about kind of how uh, the data journalism students might end up, particularly because this is the journal that's like maybe more particular to the journalism school, but I was just wondering maybe if you had an idea of where students who do do that dual degree where they might end up and whether that's on the journalism side or that's more on the computer science side because it's yeah. I think it's more on the computer science side, but in journalism companies and also in tech companies. Right. So the dual degree students, first of all, there haven't been that many of them. Yeah. Um, but like last year, one of them went to Google. Um, and I've just, I'm just, I'm, I'm fuzzy on exactly where they went, but, uh, but the typically they, they do compete pr pretty well for like the in interactive graphics desk at the Wall Street Journal, at the New York Times. Um, so they are getting, you know, at, to the big companies mm -hmm. who might not have people on staff who know, who you know, um, know this stuff or can or want to train train new people. The data students, again, it's a new-ish program, and I'm seeing them right now in the fall of 2018 compete with the Stabile students for um, internships. Um, the Miami Herald is coming on Monday to interview about 40 students not all of like ha some of, half of them are from our school and half are from everywhere else but i mean uh they're interviewing a bunch of the data students and the stabile students for um, basically reporting jobs on in the in the newsroom great thank you 
Hi there. We have another question from our live stream. Okay. This is from Liz Mizuchi. She wants to know roughly what percent of students have made a mid-career switch to, switch to journalism, and have any of them leveraged their past experience to propel themselves beyond entry-level positions? Uh, Okay, I, so the, your past always sort of imbues the, the present. So are, it's, it's really, it's, it, if, if you've been a teacher or a lawyer or, or a police officer, um, we, we like to talk to you about sort of um, carrying those interests through to journalism. And sure enough, like oftentimes our, our former teachers are really interested in education reporting. So that's where they go. The, our police officers, we've actually had police officers and prison guards and, you know, people in law enforcement who, um, you know, the, the, the daily, you know, newsrooms like them for crime reporting, obviously, um, the Marshall Project, the Trace. Um, but as far as like leapfrogging, like skipping that important part of doing an entry level, uh, not really, um, because you have no clips at that point. So you have to build up a body of work. Um, that said, like I, internships are, are important in journalism. It's, it's a really sort of um, key characteristic of this industry. I had an internship when I started out in journalism decades ago. I won't say how many decades, um, but it's, it just has always been the case. And so you sh our, stu our students, um, we tell our students early, don't freak out about taking an internship after graduation because our students do really well converting those internships into the next job. And the, and the, the truth of the matter is our students have a, um, an upward trajectory after graduation. Un unquestionably. So I hope that answers her question. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thank the daily, you. The Daily News wants you. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm going to hold it. Uh, hi, my name is Angie. Um, I am coming from a media production standpoint, more on the advertising side and, and like social media production too, primarily video, but also multimedia. And my primary interest is in video and audio journalism. Um, so I'm wondering, since they are very emerging industries, sort of what you're seeing um, when it comes to non-traditional like writing, you know, and, and publisher journalists, but more in a multimedia space. We're definitely seeing, st we have a lot of students here who have come from sort of a social media and marketing background, whether they were doing that for a news organization or a PR agency or a company. Um, and they come here wanting to get away from social and, and, act and have like a more of a reporting job. So, um, you know, as far as video and audio, there's, we're seeing a lot of growth in po podcasting, mm -hmm. not really sure how lucrative podcasting is, but it's really popular with our students. Students come here and they fall in love with audio. Um, we've seen a big growth in the number of audio companies that come to the expo, and video is always in high demand. I mean, we had an ed editor here from a print, mainly print publication recently, who said, you people are so lucky that you all learn video skills. I mean, it really is an important skill to learn. So that so that's a big part of the the program too. Is well, there's boot camp. Mm -hmm. So you probably heard about boot camp, August boot camp, which is basic multimedia. But then you can take you can take audio or you can take video um, one and video two throughout the year and and sort of become much much better at audio at, at video skills. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Jack. Uh, my question is sort of related to that, um, which is on the in the breakdown of where uh, graduates were getting jobs, there didn't seem to be a lot of change between <laughs> those getting jobs in print and those getting jobs in video and audio, even though video and audio, as you're discussing, is sort of growing in terms of what people are interested in. And I know there was a breakdown of job duties, but I'm curious if you anticipate seeing those numbers grow more. There was maybe a slight this, this chart? Th that's the chart I was thinking of, yeah. Um, and I'm curious if you anticipate the video and audio production numbers going up or what, why they might be staying more stagnant compared to what the jobs are looking like. Um, and then I was also curious uh, about, on a previous chart, there was a very small 1% sliver of people who went on, uh, it said to like, I forget what it was, but like you basically start your own media venture which, oh right or, yeah, a launching a media venture which is a tiny number but i'm sort of curious how 
that comes about or how that plays into the kind of uh, like career services that are offered. Okay, first of all, so we don't, uh, we analyze the statistics that we have. We're not really into sort of forecasting. Um, mm -hmm. It's too hard, but we definitely, um, this is what the students have told us is their main job duty. Um, they might also have to do some reporting. For instance, we had a student who was at the AP in, in Miami, the Associated Press in Miami, and he was hired mostly to be a print reporter but he took his camera everywhere, so he, you know, and, and he used it, and he took some great shots, and they were such great shots that I think he's gonna get a, a full-time job at the AP. But he would not have, his answer to this, this question, what's your main job duty, would have been print and text reporting. Our students are expected to, you know, be multitasking out there in the field, but um, at the end of the day, you are, you're still mostly gonna be writing. Um, and, you know, and there's, I mean, 26% of the students getting job in audio and video is a, is a big chunk. Um, we didn't know what, what would happen. I mean, there was this qu pivot to video that everybody talked about a year ago, and then people stopped talking about that. Um, so we're just sort of just playing it by ear. 1%, um, okay, so we're talking like two people, right? Um, it takes a certain kind of personality to want to be a, an entrepreneur, you, uh, and, and so, um, but there's an incredible amount of support and energy here at Columbia and in New York City. This is definitely a media hub here, and there's a lot of entrepreneurship going on. There is a, a New York City Media Lab in New York City where um, students and anybody can go for support and ideas and people to bounce their ideas off of and, and get advice. Um, we have the Tau Center here that um, is, a, is a center for, that is a magnet for all these um, different, the different pieces of the of the eco the the uh, tech ecosystem in New York City, and people come to to Columbia all the time to talk about their work. There's funding at the at the Tao Center for students to stay. Um, it's it's not for the faint of heart being an entrepreneur. I mean, I I you know I'm thinking like somebody wanted to go back to Africa and start a nonprofit investigative um, site. In, in Africa, and um, so that's the kind of thing, but it's not really what people come here for. Um, but if you wanna do that, there's plenty of support, and you have to get involved in it really early in the year, and just go to stuff, go to go to you know <coughs> events, and, and network, and meet people, and think about your idea. There are professionals here at Columbia, some of them are attached to the business school, that are actually available to our students for, for brainstorming. Um, so, hope that helps. <laughs> Absolutely, thank okay. you. Okay, thanks so much for your time and attention. Good luck with your applications. Well, I hope that you are getting the kind of information that you've been looking for this morning. And now I'm getting to the part that I know you've all been waiting for, which is the admissions and financial aid section. Um, and I'm going to try to go through this pretty quickly because you've been here for a long time. You've been a great audience for us. Um, and so I want to, I'm going to talk about both um, admissions, financial aid scholarships, and then we'll have more time for questions. As far as admissions, what we are looking for in a student, I mean, you've heard a lot of things now from the faculty, from our students, from Gina. Qualities, we're looking for qualities that we think make a good journalist. So good writing skills, you don't have to have great writing skills, that's why you come to graduate school. We're looking for people who are curious. Um, I think Steve said earlier this morning, you know, you get to go out and do all sorts of things and it can be different every day. Um, so we're looking for people who have that kind of curiosity, who want that. This is, this is actually one of the professions, you know, a lot of times people t tell you, you've got to focus, you've got to concentrate. Um, keep your keep your keep your eye you know on the prize. 
which you need to do in journalism, but this is also for the, pl- the place for people who like doing all sorts of things and who have very wide-ranging interests. We're also looking for people who are persistent, people who are determined. Um, there are a lot of people who don't want to talk to journalists um, and who are, don't want what they're doing to become known. It takes a lot of persistence, um, a lot of digging, all that data work that we've been talking about, the investigative work. Even if you're working on a feature story, um, you want, you're going to have to keep at it, keep after things, keep running down sources, keep running down leads. Um, It takes a lot of persistence and determination to stick with that. We're looking for people who want to be storytellers. Journalists are at, fundamentally journalists are storytellers. You want people to read the articles that you're writing, to watch your videos, to listen to the podcasts, to listen to what um, you're doing on the radio, um, to watch documentaries. You have to be able to tell a good story, or at least to want to learn how to improve your storytelling skills. And then we're looking for people who are passionate about journalism. Um, Columbia Journalism does only journalism. So we're not under the umbrella of a communication school. We don't do PR. We don't do um, advertising. We don't do media studies. We do only journalism, and the people who teach here are journalists. Um, So we're looking for people as students who have that goal for themselves, but also who will feel comfortable coming into a space where everybody is passionately focused on journalism. Um, So we're looking for evidence of those kinds of things in your applications. What does the application consist of? And all of this is is online, so I'm just going to run through it quickly. You'll have a resume. You'll have, regardless of of the program that you apply to, you will have an autobiographical essay and a journalism slash professional essay. Um, If you're doing one of the specializations, you'll write a specialization essay for to talk about why you want to do that specialization. Um, Your journalism essay is going to be about why you want to be a journalist. Make your argument for why you want to be a journalist, why you want to be trained at Columbia. Um, Your autobiographical essay, tell us something about yourself. It, It doesn't, you know, it's not you know, I was born, I went to school, I went to university, then I did this, then I did that. Choose a story about yourself that you want to tell us. We're looking already in the application at your storytelling skills. Make use of the essays to show us what your skills look like. We also ask for work samples. So these can be journalistic writing samples, things that have been published, things that have not been published. They can be audio samples. Um, They can be video samples. I think you've heard some good descriptions of the kinds of things that prospective students have provided. Um, Choose your best work. No matter what you do, choose your best work. Um, If you are interested particularly in, in documentary and video, one video sample is good enough because I think as you heard Andre say before you get to be a good documentarian you must be a good reporter and writer we want to see evidence of your reporting and writing skills in the work samples that you provide for us so what if you haven't done work as a journalist there are a lot of students who come here who haven't What kinds of writing samples can you provide? You can provide academic writing samples. You can provide, um, if you've written a book, an abstract from the book. You can provide a blog. Say you've been writing a political blog, something like that. 
um, that can be interesting for us. Um, you could, for we've had people who have come from finance who have been market analysts. And so they have given us examples of, say, market or country reports that they have written for the companies that they've worked for. So all of these things can show evidence of reporting, research, your ability to analyze and synthesize, your ability to tell a good story. I shouldn't say even if it's a financial document that's going to be presented because that gives away one of my biases. But um, you want to show things that give evidence of your ability as a storyteller, whether it's in writing, whether it's an audio sample, whether it is a video sample. The MS students take a 90-minute writing test. It is online. It is proctored. Um, you can take it at any day. You can take it anywhere and at any time. It'll be set up so that you can do that. Generally, there are short answer questions. Again, we're trying to get, we're, we're looking for examples of your writing. Um, we've got those examples in your essays. We've got the examples, the work samples that you've given us. Um, the writing test for the MS students shows us what happens when you sit down and start writing. Um, don't be afraid of it. There's really nothing you can do to study for it. If you are looking at the example of the writing test that's online from about 2003, throw that out. That was a long time ago. We don't do all that stuff anymore. There will not be multi-choice uh, questions or multiple choice questions. There um, will not be any maps, things like that. There are going to be a series of questions. You choose the ones you want to answer, and you write your responses. Um, we also, for people who are non-native speakers of English, if you were not educated fully in your first university degree at a university where English is the medium of instruction for everything, you must take either the TOEFL or the IELTS. Um, we also ask for three letters of reference. What are, who, who should write for you? People who have been your supervisors in one regard or another. So people who have either been work supervisors or people who have been your professors in school, um, professors who preferably gave you A's when you think about that. Because we do go back when we see that's, that it's a professor who's writing for you and that person says, and so-and-so took my you know, 18th century English literature class, we're going to go back and look at the grade they gave you in 18th century English literature or marketing or whatever it might happen to be. Um, what can you do to help your letter, your recommenders as they write for you? Because think about your application. You're constructing a story for yourself and you're constructing an argument for why you should be admitted. You would like your recommenders to help you with that. Um, and presumably, you're going to ask them first, will you be able to write a positive letter of reference for me? You want to ask them that first, because you also want to give them the chance to say, oh, I'm so sorry, I don't have the time, or um, I might not be the best person f to write for you things like that, because you always want to make sure they're going to write you a positive letter. Um, once they've said yes, you send your thank you email, and you attach your resume, and you attach your journalism essay. Because that way, they understand what the arguments are that you're making. And if you haven't seen them in five years, it refreshes their memory about who you are. So help them to help you. I'm going to take some quick questions um, about applications. 
the application process. I should mention the deadline for the MS programs and the doctoral programs, which we really have not talked about here, December 15th. With the exception of the dual degree program with computer science, that is January 15th, and that application runs through the computer science school application and not through the journalism school. The MA application is due January 9th. So there are a couple of different things there. You can check the website. That information is also there on the website um, in case you forget. I always forget dates. OK, questions. Please go to the microphone so that our online audience can also hear for any questions about the application process. Hi there, yeah. Lucas Woods. Yes. Um, I, I just want to confirm something. I spoke to the admissions office, and uh, for the December 15th deadline for the MS, uh, MS program, there's also January 18th, I believe, is date for all materials. Now, I just am reconfirming this for the samples, uh, writing uh, samples of work can be submitted uh, can be compiled and by submitted. January 18th. by January 18th. yes that's correct excellent we recognize that there are certain parts of your application that you have control over which are the essays your resume the application itself and in general your work samples try to get all of that in by the 15th that's what we want we also recognize you might be having a piece that's going to be published in January and you think it's a great piece um, and you want to send that in January, that is absolutely fine. Get all of your supporting documentation in by January 18th for everything. Thank you so much. Hi, I'm Amy. Um, so for the writing uh, samples portion, would you like to see just our best work, no matter what it is, as long as it's like pertinent, or would you rather see a variety of topics or a variety of like formats? It's absolutely fine to, what we're interested in is your very best work. Mm -hmm. um, we are most interested in anything that you can give us that shows evidence of journalistic or journalistic style work, whether it's print, audio, or video. Does that help? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Hi, my name is Haley Vaughn. Um, I have two quick, very quick questions, um, kind of as a follow-up to him. Um, for the extended um, January materials, is that also including letters of recommendation? Yes. Okay, and um, my second question is for letters of recommendation. I know that you mentioned supervisors, um, but what are you all's feelings regarding um, colleagues or mentors if you've spent some time in the working world alongside these kinds of people? That's a great question. Um, we are looking for people who have been your supervisors and either have given you a grade mm -hmm. or have done your performance evaluation if okay. it's a work supervisor. It can also be, it can be an editor. Um, colleagues, not so, we're not so hot on that. Um, it really needs to be somebody who has been responsible for evaluating work that you have done um, and who can comment on that. Okay, thank yeah. you. And if you have specific questions about specific people, get in touch with us and we'll talk about it with you. Thank you. Any other application questions? No. Oh, yeah. Everything was answered when I waited for everything. Okay, <laughs> great. Um, let me talk a little bit now about money. Columbia is expensive. I think you've already, you, you know that, and you chose to get up and come here this morning anyway. Um, how do you prepare yourself for making the financial investment that is required to go both to Columbia, but also to graduate school in general? And it is a financial investment. This is like buying a house. Um, and sometimes buying a house can be cheaper. Um, plan. All of the information about the costs is on the website. 
it differs per program because different programs are different lengths and so there are some different charges here and there. Go take a look at what it's going to cost you. The current year information is on the website. You can, you can anticipate that Columbia tuition and fees will go up somewhere in the neighborhood of 4%. Sometimes it's 3.5%, occasionally it's 4.5%, um, but if you use 4% as um, sort of a ballpark percentage for what you can anticipate for tuition and fees to increase, you'll be okay. Think about the costs that you have control over and the costs that you have no control over. So you have no control over the university tuition and fees. So set that aside in one category. You know you've got to cover that in one way or another. The area that you have some control over is your personal expenses, where you're living, how you're choosing to live, um, how many people you choose to live with as a graduate student. There's where you have control over your own expenses. Generally, our students live, several people share apartments together. Um, people who are really saving money on their food bills are bringing lunch and dinner in their backpack to school with them. Um, people are using metro cards, the monthly metro card for New York City to get around the city as opposed to Uber or taxi cabs. Um, I think if you are an MA student or perhaps a doc student and you're going to be traveling to do your master's project, you're going to want to figure in some additional costs there because it costs more to fly to Los Angeles to do the interviews that you need to do or to do the filming that you need to do than it does to take the subway to Queens. Um, so think about those things and then think about where you're going to get your money. Generally students fund their e education here in four ways personal funds, journalism school scholarship funds, third-party scholarship funds, and student loans. So if you're a US citizen or permanent resident, it can be federal student loans. For international students, it can be government loans. Um, for instance, for the Canadians, who, are, who live in Ontario, the Ontario government has student loans. For my students who are coming from Denmark, Sweden, Norway, and Finland, the government provides student loans. Um, for Germany, there are government scholarships that you can apply for. Um, for students coming from Latin America, there are government scholarships that you can apply for in many of the Latin American countries. Um, so start doing your research, start doing your homework, find out where you're going to find free money. Um, and then start, you know, looking at your budget and making decisions about how you're going to take care of each section. Um, think about yourself and who you are. Um, I had a check that arrived in August this year for $10,000 from a retirement home. And I looked at that and I said, why am I getting a scholarship check from a retirement home? That organization had a scholarship fund that was either for the children of people who worked there or for people who worked there themselves. So if there were people who work there in the summers, during college break, that sort of thing, they could apply for the scholarship. This was something that this student, only she knew about that. It pertained just to who she was and because her mother also happened to work there too. So you think about things like that that we wouldn't necessarily know here at the journalism school, but you will know about yourself. Another suggestion, no scholarship is too small 
to apply for. $200 will cover the cost of one monthly Metro card plus several coffees or lattes or whatever you like. Truly think about it in that way. We also have a list of third-party scholarships. We keep track of every kind of free money that anybody brings here. And we've got a list of every single thing that anybody's brought here for the last 12 years. On the website, it's in a spreadsheet. Um, you can look it up. You can sort it in a number of different ways. Um, look for the money that pertains just to you. J School scholarships, Dean Call mentioned them. Um, we do have very generous funding. You must apply for it. Some schools will do scholarship um, allocations based off the admissions application. Columbia Journalism School has a separate scholarship application. If you want to be considered for scholarship funds, you must complete the online scholarship application, hit the submit button, and submit it. People who are U.S. citizens and permanent residents should also fill out the FAFSA. If you have too much to do and you can't get the scholarship application in by February 1st, which is the deadline, and you come and ask me about it in April, I'm going to have to say I'm so sorry, but the money has been awarded. We award all of our money up front. We do not hold anything back to negotiate. Um, help us out, submit the scholarship application. We have funding that um, is completely unrestricted, and we have funding where the donor has said to us, this should go to a data student. I want this to go to somebody who is going to be a political reporter. I want this to go to somebody who is from Oregon. I want this to go to somebody from Ohio or Washington, D.C., um, I want this to go to somebody who's going to be a science reporter, uh, who's going to do community newspapers, who is going to be a business reporter, who is an international student. Um, I want this to go to somebody who is interested in arts and culture reporting. Sports reporting also. And if you play golf, please submit the application. Um, so all of... All of these, all of these kinds of things, we have boxes on the scholarship application. Open it up, check off the boxes that apply to you so that I can award the money the way the donors have asked us to. Always apply. And actually, that reminds me because there was something that one of you asked earlier about um, applying, and then everybody said, oh, I applied you know, 10 days before the deadline, I made my decision very late. You should know that journalists do everything on deadline. We expect that you're going to do everything on deadline. We know your applications will come in just before the deadline. Um, we know that you're thinking hard about this too, not just about the application itself, but about whether this is the right thing for you to do. Another thing to keep in mind is that if you don't apply, you don't find out whether you've been admitted. And if you don't submit the Journalism School Scholarship application, you will never find out if you would have been awarded money. And so you will never find out if your financial plans actually could make it possible for you to come to Columbia Journalism School. You don't get to make the decision unless you do the work first. So. I'm going to stop and let you ask questions that you might have either about um, financial planning or scholarships. Yes. I don't know, what do I do here? Okay, Angie again. Um, I'm wondering about uh, qualifications for your scholarships and your financial aid. So, um, for example, if you're, if you have a lot of student debt from college, for like, is that one of those things that is considered, or you know, if you had a decent paying New York job but weren't able to save too much money because you were paying off those debts and like your family doesn't have, you know, like how is that all considered? First of all, um, for the purposes of financial aid, graduate students are considered to be independent. 
you are no longer asked to submit any information about your parents' income. So we don't know anything about that. We're not expecting them to pick up the bill, but you might have a discussion with them about some of that. That's your negotiation. Um, we have money that is available in a lot of different sort of pies. Um, as I said, it is determined by... Um, we, we have money that can be used in a lot of different ways. Um, so really, the, the ideal thing is simply to apply for it. Just apply for it. We also recognize that if you're working full-time and you decide to go full-time to school, that that income has dried up for you. Um, that you're not going to have that monthly or bi-weekly paycheck coming in. Um, we're very aware of that. Yeah. Hi, my name is Matt. Um, sorry. You can just tip that up. Okay. Um, are scholarships awarded to part-time students? Scholarships are awarded to part-time students. Um, they're prorated, so proportionate to what is awarded to the full-time students. Okay. But yes, part-time students definitely apply for scholarships. Great, thank you. Hi, Monica, again. Um, what bearing does the financial part of the application, including like whether or not our plan seems adequate to you, have on your admissions decision? None. The faculty who read the files and who make the admission decisions do not see anything about student financial information. There is no financial information in the ap admissions application. I don't even think there's a box that says, are you, you know, applying for scholarships or something like that. It's, it has no bearing whatsoever. Um, the admission decisions are made before any financial consideration happens. Awesome, thank you. Siobhan Tol, again. Um, so my question is for someone who's applying to two different programs. For example, one is data journalism and the other is investigative program. With the, the scholarship form that you talked about, do we have to like fill it, out, fill it out again or is just one for whichever program you get in? Just a single form for any program that you apply to. Um, if you have decided you're going to, for instance, apply, check off the box for the MA, and the MS, mm -hmm. um, it's the same form. We consider you for the funding that is available for the program that you are admitted to. Okay, thank you. Hi, my name is Abby. Um, I'm wondering how you define very generous. Um, like how, like what are some real numbers? Sure, sure. Actually, you can see some real numbers on the website. If you go into um, the scholarship section, um, in general, I would say that about 80% of our students receive some kind of scholarship assistance from the school. Um, I am anticipating that people are going to be receiving, and I haven't gotten the scholarship budget yet, So, um, but I'm sort of basing my an anticipation on previous years. People will be getting awards that can go from um, $25,000 to full scholarships. I have um, some full scholarships in the data program. I have one for an Italian national in the politics MA program. Um, and I've got you know some others sort of scattered around. Um, but it's also possible that you would get 50 to 75 percent of tuition and fees. Um, so those are fairly substantial um, scholarships. Hi, uh, I don't know if you already addressed this, but what about people who aren't like um, citizens or permanent residents, but they're also not necessarily like international students? For the purposes of applying for scholarships, everybody, citizen, non-citizen, permanent resident, any other immigration status in the United States should apply for scholarships. 
I have money for all sorts of groups. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, this is your last chance. This is your last chance. I want to take two minutes very quickly to introduce some admissions colleagues who are here. Uh, Taryn Almanzar in the back of the room, our assistant dean for financial aid and admissions. You'll be hearing a lot from her. Um, she's lost her voice, which is why you haven't heard from her today. Um, I'd also like to introduce you to David Hooker, who has been running the chat and who many of you have been in contact with either by email or by telephone. David runs our office. Um, and then I'd also like to introduce John Graham, who you've seen ask some questions for people who are on the chat. John is going to be joining us as an assistant director of uh, admission and financial aid on December 10th, and he was kind enough to join us for the day today. Okay, thank you all so much. Thank you all who are on the chat and who've been on the live stream for joining us. Um, it was great having you here. We are happy to, for those of you who are here um, in the New York audience, we're happy to take other questions. Um, we're going to shut the live stream in a second, uh, but we're happy to take your questions. Um, and for those of you who are not here in New York, please feel free to email us if there are other questions that you have. We'll be happy to help you with them. And always ask questions. I always forget, and there's always a question. I'm sitting on the subway thinking to myself, oh, I should have asked that. Just email or call us. We'll be happy to help you with it. Thanks again for coming today.